Hi, I'm Eileen Bild. I'm with Hotel Chalk, and I'm thrilled today to have with me Asia Carroll. Hi, Asia. How are you today? I'm well. Thank you so much for having me on the show. How are you? You're welcome. I'm doing awesome. So Asia is the CEO of Survivor, not by chance. She has a bachelor's degree in business administration from New Jersey Institute of Technology. Asia is a certified life coach, motivational speaker, author, mentor, and advocate for childhood trauma, as well as a consultant. She has clients from across the globe with various experiences. And she has mentored teenagers and young, adult, young adults for over 15 years. Asia is the author of the book, The Pressure of Becoming a Diamond. So I think I wanna start with, uh, give us some background on what brought you to writing that book. So I had some challenges growing up. You know, we all have pressures in life. We all have things that we have to overcome. And some things kind of force us or push us into our destiny. We can choose which way and which direction we want to go. For me, you know, I dealt with homelessness as a teenager. Um, a young child, I, I dealt with foster care. You know, my mother struggled with a drug addiction. Um, there was a lot of toxic energy in the home. And I was, I always felt like I was different. And I always mm -hmm. felt I wanted something more. And so I just wanted to share my story with the world, because there's so many people out there that feel alone. And they feel that they're the only ones going through the situation. And so I just wanted to give people positive hope that despite your circumstances, your past, your present, or your future, you have the right and the ability to change it and make it to what you want it to be. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that should be like a, um, uh, you know, something that every person who's going through trauma should hear because uh, it's not easy. It's a different right. path. Yes. And when you read about someone like yourself, who went through so much trauma and difficulty and challenges and just what I call a life curveball. And yeah, look at you today. You. Um, it's inspiring. And <laughs> so what are some of the key things that you feel helped you to move past that potential of becoming the victim in those circumstances into uh, you, you looked at all of your life experiences as opportunity to become a better person yes, and, and to move forward. So what would you say were, were some of the key things that you thought or some of the actions you took that enabled you to, to move through and eventually out of those circumstances? So I would say um, most importantly, just believing in myself, um, knowing that what was in my environment, I didn't want. And so I knew I had to do something different than what I saw. And in order for me to have different, I had to change my mindset. Mindset is key. Um, you know, it was struggle. It was hard. But I thought and I prayed. And, you know, at, a, at that time in my life, I wasn't into meditation. I didn't really know what meditation was. But I knew that I had to focus and so I put my energy in school and I put my energy into getting good grades and I put my energy into reading books. Books literally were my escape growing up. I read a lot of books and I loved reading um, nonfiction. <laughs> you know, you don't know many teenagers who actually enjoy reading nonfiction books, but it gave me hope. It inspired me. Uh, one of my favorite books was I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. Mm. And when I read that book, that gave me hope. Like, wow, this woman is famous. She's she's doing amazing things. She's an author. Like, And she went through some of the things that I experienced. And just reading her story and reading what she went through inspired me. Well, that and that gave you not only hope, but 
the ability to see that you could get out of where you were. Exactly. And, yes. And, and that uh, regardless of what other people might have said, might have done, you could still push, keep pushing through. And, and I'm going to bet that the nonfiction was almost like uh, food for the soul. Yes. It, it helped you, that deeper part of you mm -hmm. to um, find that authenticity of who you were, yeah. not what people might have identified you as based on your circumstance. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I saw so much of myself in reading the books because mm. like the experiences were so similar. And, you know, a lot of people today don't really know how great Maya Angelou was when she was here and what she brought to the universe, you know, especially the young, younger generation. And so right. I just want to be that person to build that, to bridge that gap between the younger generation and, you know, us. Sounds like you want to educate people yes. on what it takes to um, live life to the fullest, regardless yes. of what circumstance you're in or what experiences you're having. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm all about core thinking and like you, our thoughts are very important. Yes. And um, what would you say was your most difficult time during the most challenging part of your life? And what did you have to think or, you know, what did you put into place? So if someone's listening and they're just down and out and with everything that's happened this last year, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people struggling to come out of whatever place they're in. Uh, if you could share some of the tools, techniques, um, you, you talked about meditation, but in that time when you were in high school, uh, if you could give some specifics, that would be really good. Sure. Um, so in the book, basically, I share information um, about my experiences in a different perspective. And so what actually happened in real life are things that happened in a book, but there's different people that um, I would say that are in the book that cause trauma that did not cause trauma in real life. So for me, when I was in high school, the hardest thing was trying to figure out what I would do after high school. Hmm. At the time, I was in foster care. And so my guardian um, legally didn't have to take care of me after 18. Hmm. And so I had to figure out what I would do. And so I knew I needed to go to college um, because that was my way out per se. And, but I didn't know how I was going to pay for it. And so it was, it was hard. It was tough mentally trying to figure out how am I going to pay for college? How am I going to find a place to live if I can't get in college? And, um, you know, how am I going to find food to eat, a job, etc. So that was very challenging for me. Um, but I was going to church at the time and th my pastor said, if you want something, you have to speak it into existence. Mm -hmm. And it struck with me. It stuck with me. And I'm like, hmm, okay. I don't know if it's going to work, but <laughs> I'm going to try it. So every day for about three months, I said, I will get a full scholarship to college and my books, room and board, everything is going to be paid for. And I just kept saying it and kept saying it. And it was around the end of May, uh, 2002. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't really have any scholarships. I have financial aid and it's a couple of grants, but I can't even get the loans because I'm not going to have anybody to sign for the loans for me. What am I going to do? So I just kept saying it, kept saying every day. I'm going to get a full scholarship to college and my books and room and board is going to be covered. I'm not going to have to pay anything. And I just kept doing it, just kept doing it. And then little by little, I would receive one scholarship here, $4,000, another scholarship for $2,000. 
then I would get another scholarship for $3,000. Then I received a book grant for $600. And I'm like, okay, this is good. This works. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is great. Right. I still need to cover room and board. Like, what am I going to do? And then in June, I received the final scholarship that would pay the remaining balance for wow. any balance I owed. And I did not, I was not required to take those loans out. So I got a full scholarship to college. I also was able to pay for room and board with all of my scholarships and grants mm -hmm. and cover my books. And every semester I would get a refund check to help cover like, you know, laundry and making sure I would have food and, you know, so, I mean, I didn't understand manifestations at that point in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say someone was watching out for you. For absolutely, sure. absolutely. And you connected with it by yes. saying over and over what you wanted. Yes. So That's, manifestations is it's super important for me. Well, it's, it's powerful if you think yes. about it. Mm -hmm. I, I think any way we look at something, whether it's on the negative perspective or the positive, you're going to align with uh, experiences that are more attuned to that than right. the opposite. So I like to encourage people to think positive as much as possible and think as if it's already real. Exactly. And that's what I tried my best to do. And it felt like it wasn't going to happen. Like when you're trying to manifest and bring something in to happen in your life, it may not happen like overnight, you know, um, you may get frustrated with it. You may feel like, you you know what, this is not working. I'm going to just quit. No, do not. <laughs> well, the other thing is it may not happen the way you think. So you have to leave it up to the universe and the powers that be <laughs> to bring it in the way they, they feel that it's going to. And so you have to be open to uh, letting go of the how and just knowing that it will. Yes, because honestly, I thought I was just going to get one full scholarship to cover everything. Oh. In, in my mind, it never dawned on me if I get multiple scholarships, it'll still cover everything. Right. Cause, you know, when you're in high school, the only thing you know of is your friends are getting, cause I was in the top five of my class. So my friends are getting full rides to schools from that, you know, scholarship from the school itself. And I'm getting scholarships from all these little different um, foundations. Wow. But it equate to the same, to the same. result. Right. Well, that's awesome. That's a, that's an amazing story. And, um, so you went to college and what did you major in? When I went to college initially, I majored in electrical engineering. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I went <laughs> to a technical school, New Jersey Institute of Technology, super tough school, super tough. But I experienced so much. It was amazing. Um, but then eventually I changed my major to business administration. And then when you finished college, what did you uh, end up stepping into? When I finished college, it was 2007 and the market crashed. We had a huge issue um, during that time span with people trying to find jobs. There was so many layoffs, you know, 2007, 2008, it was rough. So I literally was working in a call center oh. when I graduated college. And then you went from there to, so then where'd you go from there? Yeah, from there, then I, um, uh, in, the, in the insurance industry. And so I have about 10 years experience working in claims in the insurance industry. And basically, you know, I handle all kinds of lawsuits and all kinds of things. But during this whole time span, I would always mentor young women, mm -hmm. young girls. And it was just something that I did because I enjoyed it. Right. Um, and a few years ago, I found out about being a life coach. And I learned about the difference between life coaching and with, you know, being a mental health counselor. And for me, life coaching just resonated a little bit more mm -hmm. because I feel it's healing from trauma to me and my perspective is more holistic and it's more spiritual. And I, I wanted to be transparent to be able to share my story with others. And, you know, when you're a doctor or you're a mental health counselor, you're not 
allowed to be as transparent. Mm. And so I wanted to be able to share my experiences and help people by sharing my experiences so they can see you can get out of whatever situation you're in. I would think that would give them a, a better connection right. with what they're going through and what you said in the beginning about not feeling alone. Right. And I think it would give them hope of, of healing and transformation that may take longer or could, may not happen in other kind of environments of Exactly. And, you know, for, from my experience, when I was younger, when I did go to counseling and therapy, I didn't feel like I could connect with my counselor or therapist. I just felt like there was something off mm. and I felt they, like they had a wall up, you know, because they're not able to be transparent. It's not allowed. Right. And so I didn't want to have that wall in between myself and my clients I wanted to have that, I'm a huge on energy. And so I wanted to have that exchange of energy so that we can help each other through that exchange. And that is important because a lot of it is how someone feels right. and what's buried underneath. And uh, that you know, it takes skill to be able to bring that out of someone to where they feel a relief. And it's not like a record that plays over and over again. Exactly. And I'm thinking, you know, it doesn't sound like you had that issue as far as um, having repeated thoughts that could have hindered you and stopped you. How did you deal with um, maybe outsiders telling you when you had your experience, um, the traumatic experiences when you were younger, that puts you on the path to heal and to become who you become. Um, how did you block or avoid, you know, getting caught up in other people's um, ideas of, you know, who they think you were or should be based on your circumstance? So I, I actually did struggle with um, self-harming thoughts. I struggled with self-doubt. And I had a lot of negative people in my atmosphere to tell me negative things about myself. And it was a challenge. Um, the only thing I can say that actually helped me get out of that mindset from time to time was reading. Mm -hmm. Reading was literally my lifesaver. Um, of course, I believe in God. Of course, I believe in the universe, you know, and I believe in our spirit guides being here to help us. But at that time, when you're a teenager and you don't have positive reinforcements all the time, it's hard. And I've had quite a few, I call them my angels, but they're people mm -hmm. that were there to encourage me. And so every time I felt, I just was like, you know what, I'm throwing a towel in. I don't want to do it anymore. And I would have someone help me and guide me and say to me, you're beautiful. You're awesome. You're wonderful. And that will kind of re refresh me. Awesome. Well, it sounds like the reading and the nonfiction gave you a connection with a, a voice yes. that was real, that took the place of those that weren't encouraging. Yes. And so that gave you, again, the hope and the desire to move yourself forward and to get out of that mindset and into a new mindset. Yeah. So you've taken all of your training and your, you know, what you've done for yourself and um, you're doing things out in the community. Are you doing anything currently for church for children who are affected by trauma? Yes. So, um, Every area is different. I know where I live in New Jersey, there's a huge disparity for um, minority students in regards to how they're being taught, the disciplinary actions and things like that. For example, one of the middle schools has a dis um, disciplinary actions for white students. It's a 44% population of white students and they are disciplined at 7%. Mm. Um, we have 34% of black students in the same school and 33% of those students are disciplined. Hmm. 
So it's a huge disparity in regards to how they're disciplining this, the white students versus the black students and the brown students. They have, um, you know, a whole lot of different things happening. So I became a childhood trauma advocate and I use my voice and my platform to bring awareness to the disparities in the schools and how they treat the students. Um, I have had several issues myself in regards to my children and labeling and things like that. But so what I do is I organize and I bring parents together to help come up with solutions and plans to use our voices to help bring this disparity down. I also um, am on something called the Equity Alliance Board. Hmm. And it's basically a board that was created to help bring awareness to uh, the disparities in the schools. And it also helps change the model and structure. And so that. I'm going to help the schools figure out a way they can bring everybody together. Um, and I also am a part of the Democratic Party Committee where I live to help bring awareness and change in regards to our community because we don't have as much representation for um, Black Americans in the political party. It sounds like it's also a motivating factor. So, yes. you know, if, if there's not as much of that disparity and the disciplining, it might motivate the students. Right. And then, you know, where we live, we don't, most of the students don't have teachers that look like them. Mm. And so sometimes it's hard, you know, if you're not raised a certain way, if you're not raised around people of different cultures, you're automatically stuck into what you're raised with. Right. And so sometimes implicit bias can come off and you not realize it. And so what I do is I um, provide implicit bias trainings um, to schools, um, organizations. I also um, speak at schools. So I have schools that reach out to me and ask me to come to speak to their students. And so I go and I speak to the students. I've created a program to teach students healthy coping mechanisms so that mm -hmm. if they ever face a trauma, they have these skills and they can activate the skills when they need them. That's awesome. Every student needs to have coping yeah. skills. Even, you know, even if no one, even if they haven't had trauma, there's still right. stress. Exactly. And a lot exactly. of students. Yeah. yeah. And in today's day and age with everything going on, it's even more important. Are there, do you have anything set up uh, for virtual uh, yeah. I teaching? I do all of my um, trainings virtually. Um, so like if I have a school that reaches out to me, we'll do via Zoom or a meeting, uh, what is it? I can't remember, it's meeting something, but it's a Google um, application um, or is Zoom meeting something? Might be like Google Hangout. I know there's yeah, a Google, Google Hangout. Hangouts, Teams, it's whatever application they use basically, <laughs> I, um, you know, I do it via that application. Well, that sounds like you've come a long way from yeah. high school and definitely can be an inspiration for others who may be feeling like they're either stuck or yeah. there's no hope or, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it is mind over matter in a lot of ways to be able to find that inner strength to, um, to see that there is a full life ahead no matter what the circumstances are. And you yeah. are a good example of that. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Um, if you were to give some advice to anyone who's listening, who uh, wants to think a little different or wants to um, gain some courage, or gain some confidence, what would you like to say to them? I would say, learn how to reaffirm yourself first. There's going to always be someone to try to diminish you and your character. But if you learn to affirm yourself, no matter what someone says, it can never take away from how you feel about you. Oh, I love that. 
Did you want to say more to that? It looked like you were oh, going to well, say yeah. more. <laughs> Just take a positive affirmation every day. Like say, for example, for me, I'll say every day to myself, I love you. I'll say to myself, you're beautiful. Even if you don't believe it, just keep saying it. Because it's true, whether we believe it or not. (laughs) And eventually you will believe it. Right. If you repeat something over and over, it becomes a new belief. Absolutely. Yes. It takes 21 days to build a habit. And it does that. You are correct. So for the next 21 days, whoever's listening, um, repeat to yourself, I'm beautiful and I love myself. Yes, absolutely. So uh, hold up your book because I saw you um, yeah. you had it so people can see what it looks like. And it's the pressure of becoming a diamond. And uh, tell people how they can find you or where they can find you and where they sure. can find the book. Sure. So you can find me on Facebook. My Facebook page is Survivor Not By Chance. You can find me on Instagram, which is Survivor Not By Chance. My website is www.survivornotbychance.com. And the book is listed on Amazon. Um, You can go on my website and you can find a copy of the book there. You can see some YouTube videos. You can see some of my healing process from me you know, going through my healing journey when I created a podcast about two years ago. Um, You can see it's, I have information on there about childhood trauma, what it means and how people can heal. Um, So if you're interested in life coaching sessions for yourself, your family, reach out to me. I'm more than available to help anyone. And um, you can definitely go to Amazon, just type the pressures are becoming a diamond, or you can type my name and automatically the book will come up. That sounds awesome. Well, thank you. It's been a wonderful conversation and you're welcome. And uh, I think people will be inspired and have hope after hearing your story and all the wonderful advocacy and teaching that you're doing. Thank you so much. And you have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.